Verse 6, But of those who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. This is a good point in Paul's refutation. Paul disparages the authority and dignity of the true apostles. He says of them, which seem to be somewhat. The authority of the apostles was indeed great in all the churches. Paul did not want to detract from their authority, but he had to speak disparagingly of their authority in order to conserve the truth of the gospel and the liberty of conscience. The false apostles used this argument against Paul. The apostles lived with Christ for three years. They heard his sermons. They witnessed his miracles. They themselves preached and performed miracles while Christ was on earth. Paul never saw Jesus in the flesh. Now, whom ought you to believe? Paul, who stands alone, a mere disciple of the apostles, one of the last and least? Or will you believe those grand apostles who were sent and confirmed by Christ himself long before Paul? What could Paul say to that? He answered, What they say has no bearing on the argument. If the apostles were angels from heaven, that would not impress me. We are not now discussing the excellency of the apostles. We are talking about the word of God now, and the truth of the gospel. That gospel is more excellent than all apostles. Verse 6. God accepteth no man's person. Paul is quoting Moses. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. Leviticus 19.15. This quotation from Moses ought to shut the mouths of the false apostles. Don't you know that God is no respecter of persons? cries Paul. The dignity or authority of men means nothing to God. The fact is that God often rejects just such who stand in the odor of sanctity and in the aura of importance. In doing so, God seems unjust and harsh, but men need deterring examples, for it is a vice with us to esteem personality more highly than the word of God. God wants us to exalt his word and not men. There must be people in high office, of course, but we are not to deify them. The governor, the mayor, the preacher, the teacher, the scholar, father, mother, are persons we are to love and revere, but not to the extent that we forget God. Lest we attach too much importance to the person, God leaves with important persons offenses and sins, sometimes astounding shortcomings, to show us that there is a lot of difference between any person and God. David was a good king, but when the people began to think too well of him, down he fell into horrible sins, adultery, and murder. Peter, excellent apostle that he was, denied Christ. Such examples, of which the scriptures are full, ought to warn us not to repose our trust in men. In the papacy, appearance counts for everything. Indeed, the whole papacy amounts to nothing more than a mere kowtowing of persons and outward mummery. But God alone is to be feared and honored. I would honor the Pope. I would love his person. If he would leave my conscience alone and not compel me to sin against God. But the Pope wants to be adored himself, and that cannot be done without offending God. Since we must choose between one or the other, let us choose God. The truth is, we are commissioned by God to resist the Pope, for it is written, We ought to obey God rather than men. Acts 5.29 We have seen how Paul refutes the argument of the false apostles concerning the authority of the apostles. In order that the truth of the gospel may continue, in order that the word of God and the righteousness of faith may be kept pure and undefiled, let the apostles, let an angel from heaven, let Peter, let Paul, let them all perish. Verse 6. For they who seemed to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. The apostle repeats, I did not so confer with the apostles that they taught me anything. What could they possibly teach me since Christ, by his revelation, had taught me all things? It was but a conference and no disputation. I learned nothing, neither did I defend my cause. I only stated what I had done, that I had preached to the Gentiles faith in Christ, without the law, and that in response to my preaching the Holy Ghost came down upon the Gentiles. When the apostles heard this, they were glad that I had taught the truth. If Paul would not give in to the false apostles, much less ought we to give in to our opponents. I know that a Christian should be humble, but against the Pope I am going to be proud and say to him, You, Pope, 
I will not have you for my boss, for I am sure that my doctrine is divine. Such pride against the Pope is imperative, for if we are not stout and proud, we shall never succeed in defending the article of the righteousness of faith. If the Pope would concede that God alone, by His grace, through Christ, justifies sinners, we would carry Him in our arms, we would kiss His feet, but since we cannot obtain this concession, we will give in to nobody, not to all the angels in heaven, not to Peter, not to Paul, not to a hundred emperors, not to a thousand popes, not to the whole world. If in this matter we were to humble ourselves, they would take from us the God who created us, and Jesus Christ who has redeemed us by his blood. Let this be our resolution, that we will suffer the loss of all things, the loss of our good name, of life itself, but the gospel and our faith in Jesus Christ, we will not stand for it, that anybody take them from us. Verses 7 and 8. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. Here the apostle claims for himself the same authority which the false apostles attributed to the true apostles. Paul simply inverts their argument to bolster their evil cause, says he. The false apostles quote the authority of the great apostles against me. I can quote the same authority against them, for the apostles are on my side. They gave me the right hand of fellowship. They approved my ministry. O oh, my Galatians, do not believe the counterfeit apostles. What does Paul mean by saying that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto him, and that of the circumcision to Peter? Did not Paul preach to the Jews, while Peter preached the Gentiles also? Peter converted the centurion. Paul's custom was to enter into the synagogues of the Jews, there to preach the gospel. Why then should he call himself the apostle of the Gentiles, while he calls Peter the apostle of the circumcision? Paul refers to the fact that the other apostles remained in Jerusalem until the destruction of the city became imminent. But Paul was especially called the apostle of the Gentiles. Even before the destruction of Jerusalem, Jews dwelt here and there in the cities of the Gentiles. Coming to a city, Paul customarily entered the synagogues of the Jews and first brought to them as the children of the kingdom the glad tidings that the promises made unto the fathers were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. When the Jews refused to hear these glad tidings, Paul turned to the Gentiles. He was the apostle of the Gentiles in a special sense, as Peter was the apostle of the Jews. Paul reiterates that Peter, James, and John, the accepted pillars of the church, taught him nothing, nor did they commit unto him the office of preaching the gospel unto the Gentiles. Both the knowledge of the gospel and the commandment to preach it to the Gentiles, Paul received directly from God. His case was parallel to that of Peter's, who was particularly commissioned to preach the gospel to the Jews. The apostles had the same charge, the identical gospel. Peter did not proclaim a different gospel, nor had he appointed his fellow apostles. They were equals. They were all taught of God. None was greater than the other. None could point to prerogatives above the other. To justify his usurped primacy in the church, the Pope claims that Peter was the chief of the apostles. This is an impudent falsehood. Verse 8. For he that wrought effectually in Peter. With these words, Paul refutes another argument of the false apostles. What reason have the false apostles to boast that the gospel of Peter was mighty, that he converted many, that he wrought great miracles, and that his very shadow healed the sick? These reports are true enough, but where did Peter acquire this power? God gave him the power. I have the same power. I received my power, not from Peter, but from the same God. The same Spirit who was mighty in Peter was mighty in me also. Luke corroborates Paul's statement in the words, And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Acts 19 verses 11 and 12. To conclude, Paul is not going to be inferior to the rest of the apostles. Some secular writers put Paul's boasting down as carnal pride, but Paul had no personal interest in his boasting. It was with him a matter of faith and doctrine. 
The controversy was not about the glory of Paul, but the glory of God, the Word of God, the true worship of God, true religion, and the righteousness of faith. Verse 9. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. The fact is, when the apostles heard that I had received the charge to preach the gospel to the Gentiles from Christ, when they heard that God had wrought many miracles through me, that great numbers of the Gentiles had come to the knowledge of Christ through my ministry, when they heard that the Gentiles had received the Holy Ghost without law and circumcision, by the simple preaching of faith, when they heard all this, they glorified God for His grace in me. Hence, Paul was justified in concluding that the apostles were for him and not against him. Verse 9, The Right Hands of Fellowship As if the apostles had said to him, we, Paul, do agree with you in all things. We are companions in doctrine. We have the same gospel with this difference, that to you is committed the gospel for the uncircumcised, while the gospel for the circumcision is committed unto us. But this difference ought not to hinder our friendship, since we preach one and the same gospel. Verse 10. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. Next to the preaching of the gospel, a true and faithful pastor will take care of the poor. Where the church is, there must be the poor, for the world and the devil persecute the church and impoverish many faithful Christians. Speaking of money, nobody wants to contribute nowadays to the maintenance of the ministry and the erection of schools. When it comes to establishing false worship and idolatry, no cost is spared. True religion is ever in need of money, while false religions are backed by wealth.